The years between 1880 and 1920 saw a number of key moments in British working class politics. The rise of powerful unions, strike waves and new political organisations, including the Labour Party. This period saw numerous publications from the working class movement criticising the present state of things and putting forward ideas for how it could be different. One way in which they did this was to draw on traditions of popular storytelling, using fables, parables, allegories, fairy and folk tales to present why and how society should be transformed. This is working class literature. A la mattina Appena alzata Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao alla mattina Before we start, a quick note to say that we're only able to continue making these podcasts, both working class history and working class literature, because of the support of our listeners on Patreon. If you like what we do and want to help us with our work, join us on patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, where you can get benefits like early access to episodes, exclusive bonus content, discounted books, merch, and more. Link in the show notes. This is the first part of a double episode with author, poet, and professor of children's literature Michael Rosen about his anthology Workers' Tales, Socialist Fairy Tales, Fables, and Allegories from Great Britain. Part 2 is available now for early listening for our Patreon supporters. The Workers' Tales Anthology is a collection of short stories from the late 19th and early 20th century labour and socialist press, which were written to entertain and educate readers of all ages on the nature of class society and the principles of socialism. This period is one of particular significance in the history of working class politics in Britain. It's a period that encompasses the major strikes of new unionism in the 1880s, and the great labour unrest in the lead-up to World War I. It saw new workers' organisations, radical ideas and political parties, as well as huge wars and the expansion of empire. Michael gives an excellent historical overview of the period in our bonus episode, available exclusively for patrons. However, another important but often forgotten bit of context for the stories in this anthology is that of the Socialist Sunday School. Well, the first thing to say about the Socialist Sunday School movement is that it's a Sunday school, and that tells you a lot. What that tells you is that embedded in British culture was the Sunday school. So some young people may not even know what that is. I was brought up in a time when um, maybe as many as half, two-thirds of the children in my primary school class would go to Sunday school on a Sunday. So these were the the formal Sunday schools, the religious Sunday schools, these were run by most of the churches uh, in different forms. For the Catholic Church, it was a way of training children uh, in preparation for confirmation, so they were learning the catechism and that sort of thing. And then the C of E, the Church of England, would have another set of uh, principles of going to Sunday school, and the Methodists, and you know, by and large, most of the Christian kids in my class belong to those kind of three versions. And then there's a Jewish version, uh, Cheder as it's called in Hebrew, which is, uh, or we would call them Hebrew classes, where children would go uh, and learn Hebrew. Uh, that's sort of a bit equivalent to Muslim kids going to the madrasa and learning Arabic. So this idea of going on a Sunday for a form of religious training was deeply, deeply embedded in British culture. In fact, you know, when we talk about literacy and when we talk about story or we talk about consciousness, it's a crucial part of growing up for millions of people at this time. And in fact, you could argue that a lot of these stories really rely on the fact that the way in which people configured ideas was through the tellings that went on in places like Sunday schools. So I had, if you like, a sort of bit of Sunday school education in two ways, one through Hebrew classes, which I went to for a bit, but also through the kind of religious instruction that we had at school. And so these involve not simply just telling the stories in the Bible, uh, but also the retelling of Jesus's parables. So let's just hold, let's say, that one of the most famous in our mind there, the Good Samaritan. So Jesus, as he's told in the Bible, tells a story about a Jewish bloke lying by the side of the road in rags and he's been beaten up uh, or he's hurt. And so the Good Samaritan uh, comes along and helps him. And this is the story about helping your fellow man. 
um, even though Jews and Samaritans uh, were not getting on very well at the time of the Bible. So Jesus tells this story about loving your neighbor. It's, it's, it's part of it. Now, in Sunday schools, these kinds of stories were told. So when you've got a socialist movement developing, when they're thinking, well, why do we in the socialist movement, as it were, just think that the only place children can go for ideas should be those controlled by the churches? So they basically said, well, we can run a form of Sunday school. So they, what they're doing is, as it were, taking the prevailing culture and saying we can adapt it. And basically this movement, and it was a movement, spread. Um, I mean, I've seen various statistics on it, but you know, some people suggest that uh, you know, there were hundreds of branches involving tens of thousands of children. And, of course, they needed stuff to read and to talk to the children with. And so that's why you get someone like F.J. Gould who uh, is represented in the book, who wrote specifically socialist tales. In fact, he wrote a whole a huge number of tales. Some of them, they're more like kind of saying, this is how the world works. So they're, they're almost like adjuncts to school. And these socialist Sunday schools, they had little sort of uh, almost kind of Ten Commandments of their own to learn about being kind and good with each other and, and so on. So... It, it was a very strong movement, and then it, it dwindled and dwindled, as, as these things do. Um, and it can be seen alongside somebody else who's represented in the book, um, Blatchford. Um, so he's a figure, I mean, we might come back to him. He's a figure that's very interesting, because Blatchford believed in a form of kind of, right, I have to use this phrase very carefully, national socialism, in other words, a sort of form of patriotic socialism, so I'm not talking about Hitler here at all, all right? And he created, Robert Blatchford, this was, uh, 1851 to 1943, and he's a crucial figure because he did set up a whole set of organizations like cycling clubs and, and the like to support the idea that socialism could go on in a social way amongst working people. So this is not the same as anarcho-syndicalism because it's not about formal organization about taking power. In a sense, it's almost just the opposite. It's saying we can organize ourselves into working people, cycling clubs, and so on. And some people, famously Raph Samuel in his book, Theatres of Memory, uh, places quite a strong emphasis on the idea of self-organization, no matter where, no matter how. And other people think, well, in some ways, it was more of a kind of distraction. Um, but, you know, this is a matter of debate. But Blatchford himself, he appears in the book um, with various stories. Uh, for some people, he's rather a dishonorable figure because he did as much, if not uh, more than anybody, in making sure that working people um, got behind the flag and went off to fight in the First World War. Um, but, um, you know, I wasn't going to get particularly into that. The authors in Workers' Tales come from a variety of political backgrounds and traditions. Michael discusses a few of them here, and he also mentions quite a few different people and groups, some of which listeners may be unfamiliar with, so I'll try to summarise some of the more significant ones. The Clarion was a weekly socialist newspaper started in 1890 by Robert Blatchford, who Michael spoke about earlier, and was the best-selling socialist publication of its time. The Commonweal was the newspaper of the Socialist League, a revolutionary socialist group started by, among others, the painter and textile designer William Morris and Eleanor Marx, Karl Marx's youngest daughter. The Labour Church was a Christian socialist organisation which produced the Labour Prophet newspaper and the Labour Hymn Book. At its height in the mid-1890s, it had over 50 congregations across the UK, as well as some in Australia, New Zealand and the United States. The Independent Labour Party was a political party set up at the end of the 19th century that was to the left of the Labour Party. Keir Hardy was one of the founders of the Independent Labour Party, and then later the Labour Party itself. The Fabian Society was, and to an extent still is, a British socialist organisation promoting progressive change by reform rather than revolution. Michael also mentions a movement called syndicalism, which is a rank-and-file tradition within the labour movement that seeks to advance working-class politics through direct action rather than politicians. Michael discusses syndicalism in a bit more detail in our bonus episode, 
available now for our supporters on Patreon. Anyway, like I was saying, these authors came from a variety of political traditions. So uh, what I've put in the book is really quite a a mixture in terms of intention and, if you like, their source, their provenance, as it's called, where where they come from. Because you've got to imagine a time, this is all before telly and radio, so you have the first major mass market newspapers and magazines coming out of Rothermere, uh, the Rothermere Press and, and so on. So these are circulating amongst working people. And almost in reply, there's a huge network of socialist newspapers. I mean, it's very difficult, I notice, for the historians to even keep track of them because they rise up, say, in the South Wales coalfield, uh, or the Yorkshire coalfield, say, they rise up and then disappear. And so they're kind of self-made newspapers um, that are trying to support working people in their actions, but also in their social lives. It's amazingly lively and fertile because these are, by and large, working people writing about what they want, their conditions of work. So you have the formal ones like Clarion and Commonweal, um, but then you've uh, and then you've got the Daily Citizen and so on. Uh, but you've got smaller ones, um, Labour Profit, for example, which was the official organ of something called the Labour Church. Um, you have uh, Teddy Ashton's Northern Weekly. You have today a monthly gathering of bold thoughts, which then turned into the monthly magazine of scientific socialism. You have Workman's Times, a weekly periodical published first in Huddersfield, then in London, and then in Manchester. You know, it was largely affiliated to the Independent Labour Party, that one, which many people will have forgotten, uh, the, the ILP, which went into uh, the Labour Party. You had Labour Leader that was founded in Glasgow by Keir Hardy in 1888, which in turn came from a, a newspaper called The Miner. Um, so you have these whole this whole network of newspapers and many others that I'm, I'm not referring to that just popped up and then disappeared again, which were trying to represent forms of socialism, syndicalism, or indeed the, the main organs of uh, the Labour Party, the Fabian Society, uh, the organisations that preceded it, Social Democratic Federation. So in, in this book, in a sense, I've culled um, these stories uh, from these newspapers and magazines. So they're circulating. And by and large, not all of them, but by and large, most of them are actually written for adults. It's slightly misleading because we're so used to the idea of the word fairy tale, meaning therefore for children. But fairy stories and folk tales, I mean, that's a whole other complicated issue. They were meant for as wide an audience as possible. Let's forget there are adults and children. They're for people. Um, and that's one of the, the, the intentions of them. They're actually what you might call populist tales. It's a way of configuring socialist ideas into popular forms like parables, allegories, fables, fairy tales, um, and even using a couple of sort of literary ideas like science fiction and what I call mystery tales. Um, so that's the source, if you like, for these stories. There isn't any writing from the authors in this anthology explaining why they thought it was important to put socialist ideas into the form of fairy tales and fables. However, Michael speculates, with reference to British communist folk singer Ewan McColl and Russian communist novelist Maxim Gorky, that these writers may have been trying to draw on easily recognisable forms to promote potentially new ideas. I can't say that I've read any theory from any of those people uh, saying why exactly they thought they could or should cast socialistic ideas into the, these narratives, into these little short stories. I've heard people like, say, somebody like Ewan McCall talking about what he thought he was doing. So to jump forward to Ewan McCall and to then work backwards, if you like, and to others, to people like, say, Maxim Gorky in Russia. So we'll just pick on some of these people. So someone like Ewan McCall thought that he was, if you like, distilling the best ideas that came out of working-class movements and working-class action uh, 
whether he heard that in the speech of working people or in what he saw written down, and turning those into forms that already existed amongst working people. He would, with the help of Charles Parker, go out and record working people talking about the nature of their work and then turn those into songs, in a sense, kind of feeding them back. And it was a mixture of class consciousness or resistance that McColl tried to express through the songs. And he was doing this very, very knowingly. He knew he knew what he was doing. And you can go through the songs and, you know, I could almost underline the bits where I know that, you know, he took that phrase from somebody he either interviewed or Charles Parker did and put them into the songs. So one of the first songs he ever wrote was about the, um, the great Kinder Scout resistance to get uh, you know the paths open on Kinder Scout and he wrote his song I'm a Rambler I'm a Rambler from Manchester way uh, you may think I'm a wage slave on Monday but I am a free man on Sunday I'm a Rambler I'm a Rambler from Manchester way I get all my pleasure the hard and way I may be a wage slave on Monday but I am a free man on Sunday. The day was just ending and I was descending down... The Kinder Scout resistance that Michael mentioned was a mass trespass which took place in 1932 at Kinder Scout, a large moorland plateau in the Peak District between Manchester and Sheffield. The mass trespass was organised by activists from the Communist Party in response to the Duke of Devonshire who owned the land and had restricted access so that the area could be kept for the local upper classes to use for shooting grouse. Ewan McColl took part in the Kinder Scout trespass and he wrote this song shortly after. The song undoubtedly deals in serious subjects, but as cultural critic Ben Harker explains, it does so in a playful way with a jaunty melody and waltzy swing, as well as musical theatre style storytelling. McColl therefore draws on popular forms and rhythms for his political message. So that idea of I'm a free man on Sunday, you know, he took from what was in the air from a political movement and then he created this this song. So if you look at that and then if you again you go a bit earlier and you find somebody like Gorky in 1930, I can't remember the exact year, sitting down and saying, what, what are we trying to do? Now, this was in the Soviet Union, but one of the key things that Gorky and others were looking at was What do we do about the tales and the traditional stories that already exist amongst the working people that, in theory, uh, the Soviet Union is supposed to be acting on behalf of? We know that, at least I know, that all got corrupted and so on, but heavily were worse than corrupted. It became a disaster. But um, So we're just in cultural terms. So Gorky identified certain aspects of what they called the folk tradition where there are resistant elements in it. So he identified, for example, the German trickster stories of somebody called Till Eulenspiegel and said, look, this this has got class content. It's about a, a peasant who, in a sense, is uh, poking fun at and resisting um, the rising middle class or indeed the aristocracy or the church. And so he said, well, we can do, we can, we can in a sense, ride on that and create our own stories using those sorts of stories. Now, if you then work backwards to this collection, I can see aspects of that. You know, there's versions of Little Red Riding Hood. Um, there's a story is called The Man Without a Heart. Now, these are very much along the ideas of, of, of the folk and fairy story, but adapting it for the use for a socialist story. Um, so you have those stories, which are very much in this long-standing tradition of adapting you know, a form that's already there. And then others are looking sideways, if you like, into literary traditions. Um, so you've got what I call mystery stories that I've already mentioned. And these this was a vogue that started up in the 19th century of creating stories that, um, it, well, if, if I tell you, for example, there's a Hans Christian Andersen story called The Shadow. So this is about a man who has a shadow, and the shadow takes over from the man. So it's a very mysterious, you might call it like a fantasy. Other people might use the word expressionist. But the idea is is that you know we are divided in our heads, and the, the shadow represents that. And then there's a power struggle between the man and the shadow. Well, that idea 
that way of telling stories uh, I've represented in the book as well. You've got um, uh, a guy called Winchevsky, for example, who's got a story called He, She and It that is, is, is very like that. And then there's another tradition uh, which is really like a science fiction one. You've got a, a story called The Martian's Visit to Earth and another one I'm very fond of called The Aerial Armada, what took place in AD 2000. Well, in a way, it's predicting the Battle of Britain. It was written in 1913. You think, you know, air flight and militarized air flight are sort of just beginning. And there was someone uh, uh, writing in a socialist journal predicting that what will happen is that all these battles that we're, you know, being told and forced to join in, that it'll all go into the air. And um, as we know uh, from the whole history of aerial bombing, that that's come to pass. So there are these traditions that these stories rest on. And um, I think people thought they could rejuvenate, revolutionize forms that already existed. And that way you made them more accessible. So socialist ideas, I can stand up and sit there and paraphrase, you know, a socialist writer, Rosa Luxemburg or Karl Marx for that matter, and do it as a speech. And it'll be full of abstract ideas. The advantage of a story is that it'll be attached to beings that we recognize. They may be human, they may be animals. Some of them are animal stories. The William Morris story is, is, is using animals, talking animals, which is very old tradition going all the way back to Aesop, if not earlier, as we know. So thousands of years old in order to show the kind of follies of humans and so on. Uh, in fact, there's some of the Aesop fables I could almost have put in the book because uh, they are in their own way quite revolutionary. Aesop was a former slave and storyteller from ancient Greece credited with inventing the stories now known collectively as Aesop's fables. These stories were short and, as will be seen, concluded with an ethical or political lesson for the listener. Yeah, I'm thinking of the one where the the fox uh, is, is very envious of the dog uh, and thinks, you know, wow, how can you be so well fed? And the dog says, no problem, you know, just where I live, all I have to do is just keep guard. And the fox goes, wow, is that what you have to do? By the way, what, what, while we're talking here, I've noticed you've got a thing around your neck. What, what is that? He said, oh, you don't want to worry about that, said the dog. He said, no, 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 said the fox, what is it? He said, oh, it's just a thing, you know, it's just where, you know, the, the person who looks after me, I, I call him my master, you know, he, he attaches a kind of lead, lead. So the fox, how do you mean a lead? Well, well, uh, he, well, in a way, you see, the master, he, he kind of owns me. So the fox says, well, I'll tell you what, in order to get food, if I've got to give up my freedom, I think I'll forget that. So there we are. That's my quick adaptation of an old Aesop fable, um, 3,000 years old, I think. Um, so in a way, that's what these stories are. They encapsulate ideas in the beings, human or animal, that we recognize. And I've often said about narrative, whether it's stories, fiction, short stories, films, and so on, is that what they are are ideas married to feelings attached to beings that we recognize. So I could tell you, you know, take over the means of production, and it's not attached to any being. But if I tell you the story of Animal Farm, well, it's attached to beings we recognize. The pigs take over the farm. So when you read that story, we read it, allegorically with on the one hand thinking about the pigs and on the other hand thinking about human beings and so ideas about socialism or indeed the corruption of socialism which is what animal farms about um they're made more immediate to us and you could argue that animal farm is really one of the most if not the most successful example of these kinds of stories encapsulating ideas attached to these creatures and of course we have feelings you know when boxer the horse is in the van kicking trying to get out your heart bleeds you know you think it, you know it works you, you you care they make you care if you think about politics as knowledge how do you carry that knowledge with you okay if we think socialism and socialist ideas are important how do you carry these so i think this book does ask the question as to how do we carry socialist ideas? How, how are they made portable? And I can only guess, but that's also how these writers thought. How can I make these ideas portable? <laughs>
As Michael explained, one way of making these ideas portable was by drawing on resistant elements that already existed within popular or folk storytelling traditions. The German folklore character that Michael mentioned earlier, Till Eulenspiegel, is one such example. However, as Michael explains, there are also other examples closer to home. Well, the most famous of all uh, is Robin Hood. So you can look at Robin Hood and think of it as a sort of rather jolly thing, sort of jolly green men running around in the forest and sort of having nice things to eat and every now and then having a sort of argument with a toff called the Sheriff of Nottingham um, and indeed with King John. Or if you just place over it without being too doctrinaire and didactic about it and say, well, what are we talking about here? So here are outlaws. Who are outlaws? Outlaws are people who've run away from serfdom. Okay, so serfdom is a form of slavery. Uh, I mean, not as powerful and awful. Basically, you were tied through the feudal chains to a lord and master, to an aristocrat. And of course, as we might expect, people ran away. And when they ran away, uh, they became outlaws and people could come running after them and uh, or, or not some people just headed for the city where they became employed but others clearly if the robin hood story is anything to do with reality they would set up you know became in a, f- a form of traveling people they became communalist and um and then they had another problem where to get food well you know outside of common land uh, every, everywhere was owned by big landowners, often aristocrats or officials. So, you know, if you start reading the Robin Hood with these eyes, you know, these deer that they go off and, but, you know, as we know, they don't belong to the guys in the forest. They belong to the ruling order. So now we've got outlaws who've run away from serfdom. Okay. And they're, they're nicking stuff that technically belongs to the ruling order. And then now we've got these encounters between Robin Hood and the Sheriff of Nottingham and King John. These are forms of class struggle. So this all sounds terribly doctrinaire and finger-pointy by me, but, I mean, how else do we describe it? At the heart of it, if you're looking at it through class terms, that's what it is. And remember these stories, the Robin Hood stories, they were originally songs. So, you know, they, they weren't, they were songs and maybe some oral tales. And then bit by bit they got, if you like, kind of formalized into stories and then into books and a lot of other stuff kind of added on and the story of how he died and how he was you know tricked or uh, many of these but the the core of them uh all appeared in a collection of tales called the the jest of robin hood jest meaning a a collection of stories Um, and so that's that would be a sort of example but That said, that's like a whole story cycle that you would normally call legends, yeah? But you also have, within the folk tradition, very, very simple stories that are quite often about the little guy versus the big guy. If you take, for example, Puss in Boots. So Puss in Boots rests on the idea that the third son of the miller uh, is not very provident and he hasn't got much money. But then with the help of a very wily cat he comes to overcome um, a great ogre. And the ogre, it's quite interesting, is, is really a kind of aristocrat. We don't think of ogres as aristocrats, but in the story it's made quite clear because, you know, the ogre lives in a castle and owns vast stretches of land, which, not in a very socialistic way, but the, the ends up the miller and the cat take over uh, the castle, the chateau, whatever it is, uh, because of their cleverness and wiliness in, in dealing with it, or particularly the cat, the, the, the miller's son, is not all that um, wily. So again, the little guy against the big guy. So you can look at many of these stories, if you want to, in terms of the social order. So I might describe that as class terms, you might describe it as the social order, and whether it gets disrupted, subverted by, if you like, the kind of axis of the story, the moment at which the big guy is overcome. So this upsets the social order. Uh, As I say, you know, I'm not saying it's socialism, uh, but there's something subversive about that remaking of the social order that often goes on in traditional folk stories and fairy stories. 
Another part in the Puss in Boots story that can be read as subverting the social order is when, in order to trick the king into thinking the miller's son is actually an aristocrat called the Marquis of Carabas, the cat tells the miller's son to take off all his clothes, jump in the river, and claim to have been robbed by bandits. The trick works, but its implications also undermine the idea that social hierarchies are based on God-given or inherent differences between people from different classes. Just like the day we're born, without clothes, a miller's son could just as well be an aristocrat, and every bit as worthy of comfort, luxury, and even marriage to a princess as an aristocrat as well. It undermines the dynastic principle that, you know, you're entitled to have all this stuff simply because, you know, you came out of the womb of another aristocrat. So, I mean, yes, indeed, it subverts all that because you just basically took it over by a sort of form of violence and trickery, you know, when the uh, the, the ogre says he could be a lion and then very cunningly the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Puss in Boots says, well, can you be a mouse? And he says, yeah, I tell myself to do anything. And, of course, then Puss just jumps on him and eats him. And that's the end of it. It's not only little guy versus big guy, but that these stories represent a yearning for a better life. That, uh, you know, that if you think that many of those original stories coming out of probably from sort of it, it, people disputed, but sort of from the 15th century onwards, that many of these things that we call folk stories and fairy stories it probably came out at that time, but others say much earlier. So there's this dispute about that. But they come out of a common experience for the vast mass of people of grinding poverty, the most unbelievable amount of labor, very short lives. And they could see alongside them the massive luxury of the aristocracy. I mean, it, you know, it wasn't invisible. It was just they're, they're, you know, they're living in some hovel. I mean, quite literally. What is what the word's about, a hovel, a barrack, or just a, you know, a few sticks with a bit of thatch on it or something. And there within eyesight is the lord of the manor living in this huge castle, mansion, stately home or whatever. And, and they can see, you know, you're just a human being, but you're, you're there. So, you know, this power, exactly as you're suggesting, was maintained through the mystique of the aristocracy, the chivalric code, crowns, um, armour, um, and so the mystique that this was somehow or other the order that had to be sustained, uh, these stories, yeah, they do undermine that. That's all we've got time for in part one. Join us for part two, where, among other things, Michael will perform a reading of the first story from his anthology, an old fable retold by the famous socialist William Morris. He also talks to us more about children's stories from a radical perspective, such as the underlying politics of class in stories like Wind in the Willows. We also have a bonus episode where Michael goes into more detail about the historical context for the stories in Workers' Tales, as well as the history and ideas behind syndicalism. Our Patreon supporters can listen to all of that now. For everyone else, part two will be out shortly. So, if you enjoyed the show and want access to the bonus content, as well as early access to episodes and discounts on books and merch, do consider joining us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. And if you can't spare any money right now, that's no problem. You can still support us by sharing our content and giving us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. The music for this episode was the Italian anti-fascist resistance song Bella Ciao, courtesy of Dischi del Sole. Links to stream and buy it in the show notes. I also want to say thanks to all the Working Class History patrons for making this sister podcast possible, and a special thank you to Connor Canazzi, Shay, James, Ariel Joya, Stone Lawson, and Fernando Lopez Ojeda. We wouldn't be able to make these shows without the support that all of you give us. Anyway, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed the episode, and thanks for listening. <laughs> Oh, yeah.